we've been talking about what is support and today we're going to switch gears and explore this idea or this uh, at least this word that Virginia Satir used a lot, congruence. So um, why don't you start sharing with the meditation and then we'll we'll begin. Okay. Just inviting you to take a breath in through your nostrils, filling your belly fully, holding it, then imagining that you're blowing out candles. Purse your lips and blow out the air. Inviting your body to relax. Letting your shoulders down. Taking another breath, filling your belly in through your nostrils. Hold it and blow it out slowly. Letting your body be at ease. And now taking one more conscious deep breath in through your nostrils. Holding it. And then blowing out slowly. Coming back into a natural breathing. being aware of the gift of your body that it can breathe without you thinking about it giving you life and also being aware that when you do think about it amazingly you can give a message for it to breathe deeply to hold it and to blow out that which you no longer need. That you can consciously choose to nurture yourself by breathing in and breathing out that which is not good for you anymore of letting go. I'm inviting you now to recollect on times when you have felt a sense of peace, maybe of just a nanosecond, when there was a flow and you felt at peace, or you felt energized and creative. Or you felt especially connected to someone else. And you both knew that there was a beautiful flow of energy happening between the two of you. Some would call it a heart connection, a spiritual connection, but is that free flow of energy. With, when within you there is harmony, and you're open to connect fully with someone else. And that special third energy that you experience when that happens. Or some time when you have been with a group and you have felt lifted up or inspired. special energy that comes when the whole is greater than the sum of its parts 
and you know what it feels like. You leave the group. Maybe just walking a little taller. Or maybe having ideas of new possibilities of, for your life or how you can contribute to life. Just honoring all those different experiences that Jen Virginia would call being congruent. Where everything is in alignment within, between, and among. And knowing that this is in your savings account, knowing that no one stays there all the time, because we're human. But we also can treasure those moments and remember them, knowing that the more we remember them, the more they're also embedded, so that we can more easily access them and grow in them. So with appreciation for that capacity to grow more and more congruent, I invite you to bring this to a close. and reconnect here. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. I feel really relaxed after that. Good. Good. Um, so maybe we can start. I, I took some notes for a few things that Virginia Satir wrote in okay. her book, People Making. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to read these two statements or these different uh, parts of these, this book, and then maybe we can go from there. Okay. So the first one is from People Making. She writes, congruent communication involves, or congruent living rather, involves communicating clearly and cooperating rather than competing. So she's describing some characteristics of it. Mm -hmm. To focus on empowerment rather than dominating. Mm hmm to enhance individual uniqueness rather than categorizing mm -hmm. and to use authority um, rather than force um, in a tyrannical way yes. and to love and to value uh, and respect oneself fully to be personally and socially responsible and to use problems and challenges as opportunities for growth and creative solutions mm -hmm. and um, just as a, another comment, she writes, there are people who are already discovering the secret of congruence. They are learning to treasure their own miraculousness and that of others. They connect with others on the basis of sameness and grow and enjoy each other on the basis of di their differentness. Mm -hmm. They believe in their capacity for growth and change. They know how to be emotionally honest. Um, they are vital, engaging human beings with a sense of purpose and the ability to laugh at themselves. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, so that's that's a start. In, uh, that's huge. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a lot. So yes. what, what, what was coming up for you as you were listening to that? Oh, this, um, yes, it's a blueprint, really, you know. Um, mm -hmm. It's been a and continues to be an ongoing um, challenge for me to, to get my mind around what congruence is uh, because of all those manifestations of it really in a way you know um, and um, what I'm coming to is that ultimately it's an energy space 
And it is from that energy space of um, spirit, your essence, your soul, you know, your universal mind, whatever it is, the more you're in that space, the more you will manifest those ways of living that she outlines there. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you when you describe that space, I think about the way that I've been thinking a lot in the last few years about the word self. Yes. And um, I think Carl Jung uses the word self as like this this basis, the the foundation of consciousness. That, uh -huh. and when we use the metaphor of the iceberg, I think it is that connection to life, and to consciousness. To for some people would use the word God, uh -huh. um, that 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 universal sameness that exists in me and exists in you mm -hmm. were just unique manifestations of that energy mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i think that's what you're describing when you're saying when we can draw into that energy then congruence uh, becomes a possibility but it's in that in that rooting of self that, that can happen yes and um well, one of the words that you've you've uh, shared with me and, and a definition that you've shared with me about congruence is the, wor the word wholeness. Mm -hmm. That when we're um, manifesting congruently in the world, in our relationships, uh, we, we feel whole and we may be also perceived as being whole as well by others. And that there's this flow of energy mm -hmm. within and between. Yes. And I think it harkens back to Virginia's earlier work an early emphasis on communication that a lot of what she was helping people learn is how to align their messages so their words their cognitive part and the affective part the nonverbals, the body mm -hmm. language was congruent mm -hmm. aligned mm -hmm. and uh not so not so misaligned uh with each other that it, it created confusion um, yes. when you gave your messages right. uh, yeah. Do you want to do you want to add anything in terms of the word like those two ideas, wholeness, and then the flow of energy? How do you experience that personally and professionally? Well, when I was studying with Virginia, she said she wanted to teach, uh, as she always did with demonstrations about her concept around wholeness, and so she said, "Can I have a volunteer?" So I put up my hand, and she said, "Come on up, Sharon." And um, so she said, she got out a whiteboard and she said to the class, okay, I want you to count all of the holes in Sharon, mm -hmm. in her body, okay? Two eyes, two ears, so they're volunteering all this. And she said, yes, and that she's got um, 38 holes in each of her nipples, which probably most of you didn't know. <laughs> you know she's always being funny too. And she's got 30,000 skin hole pores in her skin mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she said so she was born whole w-h-o-l-e and she was born holy h-o-l-y right right and all her holes were open but as with all of you life has impacted her you know and family messages cultural messages whatever that begins to plug up her holes and so then some of the energy gets plugged up and you're not having that free flow of energy. Mm -hmm. And the challenge now is to help Sharon identify what holes are plugged up, metaphorically speaking, yeah. and how you free those. Okay. Can what I make a connection? Can... Yeah, no, yeah, I, yeah, I just yeah. want to make a connection because I want to make a connection between the metaphor and the actual... Um, transformational process which is mm -hmm. you know you might be talking there's a variety of different ways to go about it but i think of our conversations about the five freedoms you know mm -hmm. the freedom to see and to hear the freedom to feel the freedom to say what you're thinking and feeling the freedom to ask uh and the freedom to take a risk mm -hmm. and is that i mean is that what she meant by for example one way that the holes get blocked up when there isn't yes. when there aren't those freedoms yes yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And she didn't do this, but then when I started teaching, 
based on the power of just that part for me, I decided to add to that. And so I would have people, <clears throat> somebody would be the volunteer, and then someone else would come up and say, you, it's not okay for you to see what's going on, and put their hand in front of their eyes. And then somebody else, it's not okay for you to feel, mm -hmm. and maybe put their hands on their shoulders. Somebody else, it's not okay to ask for what you want, so put their hands down by their side, so now they're getting really rigid and then somebody else to hold their feet and say it's not okay for you to take risks mm. and for that person to bodily experience what it's like to have those rules come into your yeah. body and then each of them would say and now I free you it's okay for you to see hear mm -hmm. feel ask risk and it was it's an amazing experience because people right away both the person experiencing it and those putting on the rules feel what what were the ones that were the most mm -hmm. powerful for them growing mm -hmm. up. You know? Nice. And you yeah. can talk about it, yes. And when they've lifted up all, everybody's released their rules, then you ask the person to actually move and physically, you know, free themselves and then talk mm -hmm. about what it was like when they were constricted and what it was like when they're full of, free and flowing yeah. yeah and and i'm thinking of what what's coming up for me that's a little bit different is the rules updating those rules is something that's happening inside it's happening intrapsychically mm -hmm. but i think in the way that that you're describing it it makes me also think that when those rules are transformed when maybe they're let go of or mm -hmm. they're transformed into guidelines rather than rigid fixed rules mm -hmm. that it also changes the space between people and hopefully changes the relationship and the change in the in the context of family. Hopefully it changes for everyone in the family that everyone starts to have the freedom to feel, the freedom mm -hmm. to comment, you know, the freedom to take risks. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's the system. That's the whole yes. changing. Yes. yes. And when you're describing the the holiness of the body, the pores, the mm -hmm. mouth, the nose, the eyes, mm -hmm. um, as as both literally holes that can get blocked up. Um, like if you have something to say and you just close your mouth and you you yep. you, you fix your um, needs inside and you never yes. speak of it, yes. that energy, that those emotions get trapped up and then they start to manifest as other kinds of issues. Um, so how would you tie that back to, to congruence? Yes, that well, the more those rules are updated, the more they you can practice and i really like to help people understand you know you may never fully get rid of it it becomes a consciousness that you can yeah. override you know it's uh, but that that is congruence in my mind when you're reclaiming that holiness mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. but one, one of the things i was flashing on tim as you were talking was one of the rules that i grew up with was uh, don't keep your mouth shut you know don't don't talk about whatever's going on um, and the physical manifestation of that for me was I would have these nightmares and dreams of a big plug of mucus stuck right in my throat oh wow yeah and you know yeah. then when the healing came I saw that plug go pew, out <laughs> <laughs> that must have been a good feeling yes it was a good feeling yeah. um, but at the same time, you know, I still have to, I have to consciously think about, you know, okay, say something here. Uh, you know, there's, there's a, yeah. particularly if it's tense, I just go yeah. into shutdown. Yeah. Yeah. I, as a, as a theme, I think when I was, when I was first learning about Virginia's work and some of the, the way that the, the messages about congruence were given to me, it seemed like you reach this stage of enlightenment and then you're there. Um, mm -hmm. But I really appreciate what you're saying because I think it is more realistic. It's, mm -hmm. it's been my experience. We all, we'll always have our reactive patterns because yes. they, were, they, were, they were learned and sometimes that reactive pattern is gonna be necessary. Mm -hmm. We're gonna need to fight, flight, and freeze. It's, it's, exactly. biologically, it's biologically part of our, um, the way that we're made up. And so sometimes the the congruent response is held up as an ideal mm -hmm. and then it becomes a place to feel shame if you're not exactly. in that. Exactly. And, and so, and then, so sometimes when I'm working with people, 
they'll 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 express that and say, "Oh, I reacted," and in their attitude towards a moment of reaction, mm -hmm. they're down on themselves. Mm -hmm. But there's no there's no. I don't think there's any perfect, perfectly omniscient or conscious being that's mm -mm. conscious all the time, and mm -mm. so to be able to to differentiate and say, "Okay, yeah, my anger got the best of me." Or my yeah. fears got the best of me in that moment, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and to be able to rewind back and reflect and to own it and to express mm -hmm. it and to communicate through it with if it, if it involves somebody else, mm -hmm. I think is so powerful. But I, I think how how can we help the people that we work with, and how can people that are listening to this think about the relationship that they could have between moments of reaction and and I'd say the ideal is congruent response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you, how do you think about it? Well, first of all, Virginia used to say, there's no cure, there's only evolution, okay? So she, mm -hmm. she would try to communicate that. But um, I had a, a experience that was extremely painful for me. One of my clients committed suicide. Mm. And I was beyond devastated. And I was studying with Richard Schwartz at the time, who um, also talks about he helped me understand a lot of what Virginia understood, but sometimes didn't have the words for that we all have this self, the holy place, the whole place, and then we have parts. And so again, I was kind of getting into that culture of like, oh, I've got to be, he called it self-leadership. I've got to have self-leadership all the time or I'm not healthy or I've, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I, I called him and I said, Dick, I am really hurting. And there's no way I can be in self right now, like congruent, right? Yeah. And he said, Sharon, the fact that you know that means that you are. And of course you can't be fully there right now. You're devastated. And it was such a, such a, I don't know, comforting message to me. Mm. Yeah. But again, it's like the minute you know that, you know, I'm in chaos right now. It doesn't mean that the chaos is gone, but it, the minute you can say that with your awareness, or you can say, I just reacted, you are back in what I would call in self or in, you know, congruence more, more than you were before. It's a continuum, right? Mm -hmm. In some ways. Yeah. And I think um, when, when you said, I can't be in, in self, well, I think we're always there. It's just whether we're whether we're consciously connected, yeah, we're yeah. connected to it, mm -hmm. and uh, you are having this devastating experience, the emotion of um, obviously shock or, or whatever the, the various elements of that experience was. Mm -hmm. um, but I think being able to differentiate yourself from the experience mm -hmm. is an, an important key and that that creates the space so you're not identifying yourself with i am this event i am what has happened and to be able to say i'm experiencing devastation but mm -hmm. not that i am it yes. and that i think that differentiation of the self is so important mm -hmm. uh, because comments or thoughts about your self-worth like mm -hmm. What does this mean about me as a person? What does this mean about me as a professional? Mm -hmm. I think those comments on the self, which are not, they're, they're thoughts about this, the, the ego, mm -hmm. right? The role mm -hmm. at a moment in time. Mm -hmm. But we can get caught up in, in that and think, oh my God, this is who I am and, and feel that it's permanent. Yes. Feel stuck in that. And yes. so I think, I don't know, maybe the... the bringing it back to congruence. Congruence is the ability to be in self, to be connected to yourself, mm -hmm. and to look at the experience fully, to look at the whole iceberg, mm -hmm. and then to say, this is what I'm experiencing. I'm, I'm going to use my courage to look at it as wholly as I can, as fully as I can, and then come to some wisdom about how I want to cope with that. Mm -hmm. And and your wisdom said, look, I need some support. So I'm going to call yes. Uh, yeah. Richard Swartz and and yeah. and that that's the self energy. I think that's the mm -hmm. life energy that you yes. know you loved yourself so much. You said you know I'm worthy of getting support in this time of need. And mm -hmm. um, well, I think that's there's a pos there's a clear positive thing mm -hmm. energy working there mm -hmm. in that moment. So I love the way you're able to um, 
listen to me and then translate it into the conceptual part. You're, you're really gifted at this, Tim. <laughs> you are. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> I go, oh, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I think it's, a, it's an important distinction. And when, I, when I've been reading about congruence in Virginia's books or in Barbara Joe Brothers' book, I think that making this distinction of where the self is in proximity to experience, where the self is in proximity to behavioral responses mm -hmm. is important. And, and in my reading of, of the way congruence is, is being defined, it mm -hmm. is the alignment between the inside and the outside. Yes. So one of the things that Barbara Jo Brothers wrote in her book is she said that Virginia was a very practical woman. And so she was very much focused on that it was a functional thing to have a response that matched the inside, that it wasn't just a concept, it wasn't just a thought. And um, well, well, I think this idea, this phrase of self-connection, I think is the process. I think the congruent response is the form. And we can describe the form of the behavior when it's congruent, but what is that, what is that underlying process that is chaotic, mm -hmm. that is, you know, you could call it, it's the, ther it's the whole process of therapy. But I think mentioning the self is important because of your first point, which is when we're connected to that deep, let's say divine or life energy, that's really the source of the healing that we can then move through, transform the experience, transform ourselves, transform our personality from whatever unhelpful structures that are there, whether it be family rules, whether it be emotional patterns or expectation mm -hmm. patterns or belief, um, and move into something else. So I think mm -hmm. that it's it's difficult because we have to describe what is the form. So mm -hmm. I say, yes. you know, uh, Sharon, I, I didn't like it when you interrupted me there. I felt like I needed more time to speak or something like that. I'm trying to mm -hmm. be as honest with my feelings and with you. So it comes, it's manifested as a behavior. Mm -hmm. But as that's happening, there's something happening behind the curtains inside of me, which is that I'm listening to my self energy. I'm listening to the deep yearnings. I'm listening to what I really value. Mm -hmm. And then letting that be part of what I manifest in terms of my behavior. So I think separating out, there's congruent responses, which is the form. And then there's an underlying process, which you could call by many names. For me, I'm calling it self-connecting. Yes. Um, that then results in um, you being able to manifest a, a congruent response. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about uh, Jamie uh, Ungerleiter, who defined congruence as honoring the self, the mm -hmm. other, and the context. And I really like that as well, because it fits with what you're saying. Because I believe if you are in that uh, congruent space for yourself, you will automatically, in your voice tone, mm. especially in your body mm. language, when you, it, like if you said to me, Sharon, I, I didn't want like it that you interrupted me there. If you're, if you're in that place where you honor yourself and you honor me and you honor the, the podcast, yeah, I'm going yeah. to sense that energy. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've been having this image of like, and and if you can imagine an iceberg, let's say, but I'm using it in a different way, where the tip of the iceberg involves a role that you're playing at a moment in time, mm -hmm. right? And then the rest of it is the self. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm playing with that metaphor. But when I'm working with parents, often what I'm trying to tell them is that they're, the child's in a moment in time, they're maybe the student or maybe they're at dinner. And so they've got to be a good boy or a good girl eating supper or something like that. They're in a role with their family. Mm -hmm. And when, like, if we're to move away from reward and punishment or just submission dominance as a way of being, as a way of relating, right. then... Th that puts them into chaos because they're like, okay, if I'm not doing that, then what am I, how am I teaching them? Mm -hmm. And I, and, and so I tried to talk to them about what that experience of congruent, compassionate, connective energy would feel like. Mm -hmm. And so I asked them to imagine that as you're giving that feedback, as you're saying, hey, you know, um, remember to uh, clear your plates, right? Whatever the feedback is, Mm -hmm. That if you're speaking them and you allow your voice tone and your body and your eyes to not only touch and connect with the role of the behavior you like or don't like,
but also with the self. If you're communicating mm -hmm. dialectically at two levels at the same time, and you're and you're emphasizing that you're worth something. You're mm -hmm. worth something. That's why I'm saying this, and I'm going to say it with an energy of honesty and love. Say, yes. Yes. Then it's going to come out in a very different way than if I'm just yes. focusing on the behavior, and it's just about okay, I either. Well, you're not gonna get you're not gonna get dessert if you don't clear your plate, yeah. or you know, yeah. if you do that one more time, you know, you're gonna go to bed early, right? It's mm -hmm. it totally mm -hmm. it manifests and expresses itself in a very different way, and um, yeah, it's like how so how do I maintain that connection with myself, perhaps if I'm in the role of parent, and mm -hmm. also maintain that connection with the child, so that there is that dignity, there is that there is always that connection and awareness of I'm speaking to that the essence of life in that person and mm -hmm. I, I i want to and i need to respect that um, i'm thinking about you know how hard it is to, when you're out in public and you're a parent and your child is acting up <laughs> you know yeah. because your own shame gets triggered right yeah uh, being able to honor oh this is embarrassing to me and honoring that part before you interact with the child is not easy, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. I also am thinking about how sad I feel when I hear a tone in parents that implies that the child is the enemy. And I hear that uh, enough that it, it just really, really pains me, you know. Um, because the children pick it up. I, I read that voice tone is the first you know with i was listening to something about training dogs and they said that dogs and and babies they don't hear the words it's all about the tone yeah, yeah. Do, 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 do. and if you're training a, a dog and do, 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 it's there's there's something it's it's a it's a tone and if that tone is hostile because of whatever your own issues are left over from you know how you learned to parent or whatever mm -hmm. that child picks up that hostile tone Ooh, scary yeah, yeah one of the things because as i was preparing for today i was reading um virginia's first book i believe conjoint family therapy and she she writes about how the the underlying message in most communication is validate me see me mm -hmm. understand me but mm -hmm. we don't talk that way. We don't say, mm -hmm. you know, I'm about to say something. It's really important that you, mm -hmm. know, you put down your phone or because I really want to feel validated. You know, mm -hmm. that's yep. that's that's a in terms of a whole communication, that might be one way that it looks. Um, but she talked about uh, meta communication, which is the nonverbal parts of communication, the tone, the hostile tone that you're talking about. Yes. Give yes. a message about the relationship. Yes. And I think further, it gives a message about one's attitude towards the other person at the level of their self, right? Yes, so, exactly. And that's, and that's the part to retain, to pull back, because if my tone, if I don't just say, listen, I'm really disappointed with you, but I say, put away the dishes. Like, mm -hmm. and in that tone, it's like, what's the matter with you? It's, you idiot, yeah. It's, it's contempt, right? Which is- Yes, like, exactly. Research. Yeah, one of the um, the four horsemen. So yes, that yes. Could, and I think it's probably I think it's the most predictive of divorce. Yes, um, because that tone once it's out there. One for, for me, and one of the ways I'm thinking about it is it signifies a lack of of contained and processed toxic emotion. Yes, and then the second thing is that it penetrates. It can potentially penetrate through. And I think especially in a family where, mm -hmm. you know, th it should be a space oh, of yes. trust and, and oh, yes. uh, safety, that that kind of tone then, especially for children who don't yes. have strong boundaries yet, yes. of course it's going to affect them at the level of their self. Yes. And, um, and, then, and then creating fear and further disconnection from themselves mm -hmm. makes it harder and harder for them to be honest, yes. to give a, a true account of themselves. And... Um, yeah. You know, you were talking about Virginia saying that we're longing for validation. I also appreciate John Gottman's research uh, around what he calls bids for attention. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Mm -hmm. You know, he would have couples go into an apartment for a weekend and they would have these, these cameras everywhere to, to try to sort out uh, couple relationships. And he said, you know, one person's reading a magazine and says to the other person who's watching the football game, oh, look at this, blah, 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 blah. And the other person doesn't pay attention. And then there's a little place inside of that person who was bidding for the attention of, ooh, you know. And if there's not enough acknowledgement of bids for attention and what they look like, it can begin to be destructive in the relationship. And I, I really appreciated that in my own marriage, you know, like, mm -hmm. what is, is this a bid for attention? attention? Um, you know, and, and uh, because otherwise you can just kind of stay in your own zone, whatever you're thinking about and not, and the same thing is true with children. And then to helping children to feel that, okay, we're going we're going to talk about this, but right now I want to finish this conversation over here, so yeah. that they know what they're going they're, they're bidding for attention, but that they cannot con completely because they will try. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they will try to to interrupt everything, you know. Yeah. So it's that balance of how to give them attention, validate them, and at the same time, also help them learn how to tolerate frustration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think, you know, as, as children are growing up and they're being socialized, they're, they're learning certain, there are certain limitations with time and space, right? There's mm -hmm. a limitation with time and money and energy. There's mm -hmm. a, there's a limitation in resource. And how, how do you reveal the, the limits and the boundaries in a way that preserves their self-worth, that mm -hmm. preserves their, their inner dignity? Mm -hmm. And um i think s separating it out from well i i try to always keep it in mind in my interactions uh with people in general that they're, they're always worthy that nothing takes away from that they're always mm -hmm. worthy they're always worthy mm -hmm. of respect they always have dignity and mm -hmm. it's not it's nothing to do with my responses so even if i'm not there let's say i'm incongruent i'm frustrated yeah. my behavior doesn't add or take away at all mm -hmm. but i think for for um some people i think differentiating those bids are bids for attention within a specific context a specific relationship mm -hmm. where it can i think can get problematic is if i don't get my bid then i start to believe that i'm not worth much yes. or that i believe that you believe that i'm worth nothing yes, yes. because i think that's where it goes it goes too far and we have to kind of uphold that in, in a different light where yeah. I'm I'm responsible for being in touch with my self-worth as uh -huh. an individual and uh -huh. I, I want to teach uh, my children to do that for themselves uh -huh. but it's so easy I think to fall into this belief and I think this is where uh, you and I when we've talked about um, maybe emotion focused therapy that sometimes the emphasis is so much on people being validated and accepted that that becomes the sole focus but as if there's an ideal state where mm -hmm. i'm i could i can really convince you that you have your worth and mm. that i could meet uh i could attune uh, idealistically to mm -hmm. to your bids um but i think being able to also develop a an awareness and a process of wholeness as we we're first starting mm -hmm. we started mm -hmm. talking about that mm -hmm. that's there inside of me and that I can continue to strengthen in that and say, hey, mm -hmm. you missed my bid, right? right? And I was really hoping we could connect and now I'm feeling really sad that it can't happen. Uh, yeah. But to, to share it in such a way that it's like, I'm sharing my feeling, my experience yes. with, with yes. dignity. Exactly. With self-respect. Nice. nice, yes. You know, one thing I want to add to this, Tim, is we were talking about congruence and um, incongruence and I think that John Gottman also has added really a lot to me in terms of saying you know, again you can't be congruent all the time but what you can do is repair mm. yeah. okay and yeah. you know so let's say we're talking that, that I ignore the bid that my husband puts out yeah and then later I realize, hmm, that was a bid. I can repair that. Yeah. I, you know, I can say, oh, you know, you want to 
do something together, you know, yeah. or whatever, want to hang together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, repair to me is a really important piece of this. Yeah. But you see, I think when I when I hear even the way that you expressed it in that example, it's like you're in doing that, you're in touch with your worth in looking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you're in touch with his worth in what he was trying to do by asking. Mm -hmm. right? And that's like that's a that's the ground. That's a foundation mm -hmm. that um, I think people in, in my practice are, are constantly working towards how can I really know myself, know my worth um, without having to always be in a role, having to be the caregiver, having to be the savior, having to be the mother, you know. Mm -hmm. But if I'm in that role constantly and that's how I receive anything at all, mm -hmm. then to move into something else, which is, hey, I, I have a self and I have needs and I have vulnerabilities too. Mm -hmm. and, um, I think that's, that's where... Um, a real free flow of intimacy yes. Yes. and con yes. of connection happens yes. when it's too rigidly confined within uh -huh. a specific role. Um, then that leads to resentment. It's like, oh, nobody appreciates me. I'm the one that yes. does all the cooking and cleaning. And it's yeah. in an, and it's true that person's not receiving. They're also putting so much of their emphasis and so much of their energy into a specific structure, a specific yeah. role yeah. that. The, the free flow of receiving mm -hmm. and mutuality isn't isn't there. Mm -hmm. so. I watched Virginia work um, one day with a couple, and the 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 woman had coped by placating and was very very resentful that she didn't think that she could ever you know be straight with her husband uh, and ask for what she would like. So Virginia you know pairs this down, pairs it down, is talking to her. And it turns out that she said, if you could have just one little thing that you could ask for from your husband that would make your life different, what would it be? And she says, if he would make the coffee in the morning. And she said, okay. Mm -hmm. So she had them standing up and that woman was literally shaking. I could see yeah. her trembling. Yeah. So Virginia put her hand on her back, you know, and said, I'm here for you, I'm here for you. Yeah. Now, let those words come out of your mouth, out of your throat, that you, okay, I would like for you to make the coffee in the morning, okay? Mm. It was life-changing for her because she broke that rule that we started out talking about today with holes, and you could just feel now she's got her energy. She has reclaimed herself. You know, and she, there, there's an energy between them. And the husband is looking at her like, that was no big deal, of course. He had no idea that she'd been fueling resentment and pain and therefore withdrawal, you know. So there wasn't any good energy happening between them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He didn't know what she was suffering with. And my experience is this is very true for women. That in this particular, you know, the role we have carried is to take care of other people's needs. Right. But if that comes, if it's not a conscious choice and it's coming from a should, I should do this and there's resentment and I have no rights, I, my needs don't matter. It just, it really causes depression in, in women. Yeah, and, and what I, I can just see the, the situation and how Virginia would be having them all standing up and she'd be standing up yeah. and touching and, yeah. and really ha ha allowing them or facilitating an experience. Mm -hmm. And it touches your example of what, what you witness in that situation touches upon all five of the freedoms. She, mm -hmm. she asked, she allowed them, pro they were probably facing each other directly. Yes. I imagine. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they, they were encouraged to actually see, and mm -hmm. maybe they were touching mm -hmm. and to look and listen and, and really feel each other's bodies in the presence of that. Yeah. And then for the woman to feel what the need is, I need to, I really want to receive something yes. and then to embody the saying of it and then the asking of it mm -hmm. and the risking of it. Well, yes. that's all five of the freedoms. All in that, five. Right. Yes. So she's overcoming yes. 
and uh, Virginia's empowering by them engaging that process of all five of those freedoms in that moment, in that kind of interaction, mm -hmm. not just a talking about what should mm -hmm. happen, what could happen, yeah. but actually doing it and going through it yes. and her overcoming her own um, blockages. Her terror, own, really? Her own, yeah, sure, terror, right? Because, you know, underneath every survival rule is, if I don't follow this rule, it could mean death, even psycho, exactly. even if it's just psychological, not just, yes. if, if yes. it means psychological death, it means a loss of connection. Yes. Um, so if I ask this thing, am I going to lose my husband? Mm -hmm. Maybe like that's the emotional of backdrop course. of it. Of course. So. He's going to pull back. I'm going to mm -hmm. feel his cut off. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. Yeah. Um, so I think we covered a lot of ground yeah. today. Do you have yes. any final... Uh, pearls of wisdom, Sharon, that you that you want to no, share. No, I think I think you're you just nailed it because I had only thought about she's helping her to ask for what she wants, that one rule. But by bringing in all five, I think that's that's beautiful because yeah, you know that's the essence of how we get those holes plugged up, and yeah. we don't have that free flow of energy. And and, and we, often. I, what I've described as what is inspiring about Virginia's work is that um, she was experiential. And I think, well, we could talk about elements of that. I, I think, and it's, you know, we're just using words right now. What's, I think, valuable to share is that whatever intervention she was doing, however she was interacting with people, it was a whole experience. So the yes. idea of helping people connect to their wholeness, well, you can only do that if you're embodied. If, you're, yes. if your consciousness is present yes. and you're making contact with yourself, making contact with the other and making contact yes. with the environment and, and have a connection, a feeling of support from the facilitator, who in this case was Virginia. Uh -huh. And then that all helps me feel like, hey, I'm here and uh -huh. I've got a lot more going on inside of me than just the survival coping pattern. Yes. And um, yeah, so I'm, and, and that's so much of what I've, I've learned from her and um, so that was a, a, a really um, a scenic route to talking about <laughs> yeah. and um, I think uh, why don't we stay on this topic for, for at least another time and see where okay. it goes. What do you think? Right. Well, sure. Okay.